And this is the work of Roger Barker. Roger Barker is a psychologist. If, if you haven't heard of him, you're in good company because in fact, many psychologists trained today have never heard of him. And yet he's someone in the, in the 60s who won like the, the highest award that APA gives. Okay, I mean, he, in his day, he, he was incredibly distinguished. And um, let me talk about what, what he did. What prompted Barker's work is, is a very interesting experience. Um, at about mid-career, when he was fairly well known, his, his, all of his prior work had been, had been developmental uh, studies. He, he was a postdoc of Levine, he co-published with Kurt Levine, and, uh, and was a very, very well known developmental psychologist. Anyway, Barker reports in, in, his, um, in his memoirs that one day he was driving, riding on a train a, a, through these small towns in, in Illinois, and, um, and he realized that even though at this moment he probably knew as much about developmental psychology as most people, I mean, he, was, he was up to date with the literature, he had no idea what was going on in any of these small towns. He couldn't predict a thing about what these kids were doing. He was recognizing, in fact, that what we don't know is what happens in everyday life. So he did what biologists have long done, and, and he preceded Jane Goodall by a good decade and a half, um, established a research station in the small town and began studying behavior. Okay. Now, um, I'll have to make a long story short, but one of the most interesting things that comes out of this re research, and it's not anything he expected, it, it, it really surprised him, and I I'll, I'll can try to tell you why, is that he identified that their higher order, and by that I mean collectively generated, and by that I mean generated by multiple people, structures in the environment that um, create opportunities uh, for our lives. And um, so let me get right to the point, and I'm gonna be really brief on this because time is short. He calls these environmental structures, these higher order structures, behavior settings. Um, I'll offer, I'll, I'll get to more precise in just a minute. He, behavior settings are dynamic, relatively stable, time-limited ecological entities. Um, and the easiest way to explain a behavior setting, it's actually quite easy to explain it, you're in one. Okay. A behavior setting is a pattern of behavior. In this case, it's the behavior of you know, someone lecturing and others you know, attending the lecture or whatever, supported by the milieu, he called it the milieu. I'm going to say, I think affordances really fits in nicely here. But the, by the way, the, the reference, if you don't know about Barker, which I, uh, is, is uh, at the bottom of the page, here are the properties of behavior settings. They occur naturally as a function of the collective actions of individuals. They pop into existence. Games pop into existence. Um, uh, classrooms, meetings, Parades, you can kind of go on and on and on. These are collective activities, uh, but they're structured. They're composed of, of a dynamic pattern of individuals and affordances. Um, they are objective in the sense that, and, and this is in that this behavior setting has a specifiable geographic location. Anybody have a GPS on them? You can specify where this behavior setting is objectively. It has a temporal boundary, started at 925, ends at, I'm going to shoot for 1120. Um, if I started before 930, that would have been, I would have been talking, I would not have been in a behavior setting at the time. So there's a, there's a collective agreement about where behavior settings are and when they start and when they end. Okay, so they're relatively stable structures but have a, a particular uh, life. There, th this issue is what I'm currently doing research on. Um, behaviors, the, the settings are discriminable. You, can, you know when you enter a behavior setting, and you, can, and, and, you, and, you, and you know the meaning of the setting. You know what's going on at the place. That's an empirical claim, which I hope to have some data for in a few months. Um, they're quasi-stable, meaning that they respond to threats to the integrity. So let's say, let's say instead of a lecture, this is a classroom, and you, and you have one sort of disruptive child. 
who's threatening the integrity of the setting. Yeah, what you, what you say, that Ellen says to John, John, sit down, you're, ruin, you're, mess, you're in, interrupting the class. And so that... No, and, and that sort of returns the, 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 the... helps to restore the setting integrity. And if John still doesn't respond to Ellen, then we just bodily throw him out the door. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a biological entity we're talking about that's collective that operates to maintain its own stability. Um, what's, and I, what I think is really cool about Barker is he's thinking at a level that most psychologists never get to. He's thinking about extra individual environmental structures. Um, they exist of any, ind of any ind independent of anyone's experience because if you step out of the room to go to the bathroom, we don't just all flop as, you know, mannequins. We're, we're going on without you, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and I can say a lot more about that. What led Barker to this discovery is really pretty interesting. Um, what he did in his work is he had, um, he, he, he and his research team follow children throughout their day and basically just recorded everything that they did and, this, and the setting that they were in. And what he wanted to know is, what could I use to predict the behavior of children at any given time? The assumption, there, there are a couple of assumptions you could make. One assumption is that if you knew about the kid's personality, you could predict what they'd be doing at every, any given time. Or, what Barker thought, if you knew what the child just immediately experienced, like a stimulus, you might be predict what might immediately occur. None of those things turn out. It turns out that the best predictor of what a child is doing in that town at any given time is just knowing where they are. Another, a nice way of phrasing it is that the behavior of different children in the same setting had less variability than the behavior of a single child across settings. I don't know about you, but when this, I think this is like an incredibly cool idea. That, and, and if we don't work hard, it's going to be forgotten. Nobody, because no one's doing this work anymore. So um, I'll push on. So, another, so behavior settings um, are all over the environment. We enter them, we help, construct, we help uh, generate them. They constrain our behavior, they create possibilities. We move through the environment by entering and leaving behavior settings all the time. So getting back to the everything else, what I want to say is that part of what's the everything else outside of the organism are affordances and behavior settings generated relationally. Okay. They're independent, but they're not independent. Well, that's a debatable point, obviously. Um, so I would like to say that behavior settings and affordances constitute the ecological resources of a place from a psychological point of view. It, they essentially create opportunities for doing things. And we can construct them, like we call you know, Merrick organized this. You know, so we can see this, this behavior setting has been constructed. But it's not constructed in their heads, it's constructed in the world. 